popular wishes we haven't all been sold into slavery in the minds of Moria. This is the third episode of Tux Radar Podcast. I'm Paul Hudson. I'm Graham Morrison. I'm Mike Saunders. And I'm Andrew Gregory. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, the release of Lenny, Microsoft suing TomTom, is the Creative Commons good or bad, and most importantly of all, are there too many distros? Don't forget, this podcast is brought to you by Linux Format Magazine. Uh, you can subscribe today for just 99 US dollars or 13 issues at tinyurl.com slash podcast LXF. And of course, on Tux Radar, we publish news, reviews, and other greatness every day. Book market. Believe it or not, Lenny is finally here. Debian 5.0, it's finally here. Bloody hell. What do you think, guys? No way. Has this actually happened? It's not a joke. It's actually here. Really? What? No, I must be in a dream. Well, in fact, um, uh, just the day before it came out, I, uh, I caught up, went over to see the Debian project leader, Steve McIntyre, and, um, and he, had, uh, he explained why the release had slipped a bit. Here we are on the 13th, and mm. Lenny is coming out tomorrow, as you said. Absolutely. But I seem to recall September as an original plan, yeah. so what happened? Why the, why the slip? Um, well, it's a complicated story. Oh, yeah. Basically, um, for the last couple of releases, for Etch and for Lenny, um, the plan has been all along to aim for 18 months, mm -hmm. but if we, if we ship another 24, you know, we expect that we may have a bit of slip, you know, with volunteers working on this stuff. Yeah. So if, if we claim that we're, that we're aiming for 18, but we ship another 24, everybody's happy. I think the problem is possibly too many people focused on specifically 18, which is why the story is about September. Um, there was an unfortunate mistake where a couple of the release and that updates went out, just said September, with no qualification. And that's where it went wrong. We're actually we're shipping in 22 months this time, so obviously we'd all like to be closer to the beginning of the window, but we're still very much within what we what we aimed for. So we're happy. Do Do you think it, it's going to take more of a, a in in the future to if, if you want to keep these schedules right, a, a gnome like approach mm -hmm. of saying we'll just wait six months and ship, or like OpenBSD does? And... Um, to be honest, I mean, so far within Debian, we're actually happier to just release it when it's ready. Obviously, yeah. we want to aim, and obviously we'd like to do stable releases, it's very important to us and to our users, but we want to make sure that it's right. We can aim for a particular date, but uh, unless we get a lot of buy-in, unless we know for a fact that it's going to be ready, we'll happily you know, let it slip another couple of months and make sure it's good. Yeah, so for Lenny plus one, I, I, do you have any goals to bring it down, or are you um, going to stick with the same? For Squeeze, I think we're probably going to do a similar thing. Um, right. I mean, we don't know the full set of goals yet, but again, we're still going to be aiming 18, 24 months. Um, and people seem happy with that overall. Amazing. So that's his take on it, yeah. Um, so it was planned for September, but... Yeah, well, I think, you know, everyone's used to waiting for Debian releases, aren't they? We know it's going to take a long time. We're used to waiting. It's part of the fun of it, isn't it? It is, it? anticipation. Yeah, yeah a Debian release that came out on time would yeah, suck. It would, so. yeah. It's actually the first release I've seen in a while where it's fairly cutting edge. They've managed to do a good job mm. in getting out fairly timely-wise. It's not that far behind other distros of its time. Which is amazing, really. I, I, I think they've had to do that to stay relevant. You know, not, yeah, not that exactly, yeah. Debian is, is too old or anything, but you know, there, there's sticking with really old software for stability purposes doesn't always work because older software often has a lot of bugs in it. It's the first time I think in recent history where I've seen Ubuntu users wanting to switch back to Debian, which is pretty unheard of. And cool, actually, too. It shows that you know it's not a one-way street. Do you think that's uh, some Ubuntu users who were uh, unhappy with the stability of 8.10? There have been some grumbles and gripes about the reliability of Ubuntu 8.10. Is it that? I, I thought it was more about uh, people not being impressed. Because the last one, you know, Intrepid, wasn't very intrepid. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Jaunty, I know it's got EXT4 optional and stuff, but so far isn't looking terribly much faster. Mm. So I wonder if people are just sick of uh, Ubuntu not really releasing very much, many, many changes, being a bit conservative with its changes, perhaps, and uh, thinking, actually, if I'm going to be stable, I might as well go for super stable. That's true, yeah. Who'd, who'd have thought? Uh... Maybe part of the fuss about Lenny is that the, back, the, um, the logo and the backgrounds that I've seen have all been pink, so girls like it. True, and they, uh, there are no girls on the internet, of course, as we know. It could just be that people have been using Ubuntu for a couple of years and they want to move to something that feels familiar but is completely different. And of course there is Mepis 8, which Mepis. was released shortly after Lenny. Oh, I remember it's that. It's based on Lenny, isn't it? It's based on Lenny. It was based on Debian and then jump ship to Ubuntu and then jump ship back to Lenny again, uh, to Debian again for Lenny. 
and uh, it's a, you know it's a great release. The same kind of stability. It's got some new things that they, they tweak the kernel slightly. Yeah. Some new kernel. It looks pretty. Uh, it looks the very pretty. Yeah. Nice, it looks. Yeah. Re- it, it's really really nice. Yeah, yeah. So it seems that it, it it still appears to be a one man development effort. Well, you say you say well you say one man. I'm not sure yeah. it's one man. He, the, I talked to Warren Woodford and he said actually the uh, community has been behind it very strongly. Right. They have a strong community, and you know we, we put a story up recently about uh, the kernel change in Mepis on Tux Radar, mm. and uh, we had some comments from Mepis lovers from Mepis lovers I think dot org or dot com. Oh yeah, that, they, they are very passionate. They're a small bunch, but they're very passionate about their distro. It's, it's surprising. I asked on the Linux format forums if anybody, if any of our readers still use Mepis, if it's if we should still put it on our cover disk, and uh, and quite a few of them have appeared out, seemingly out of nowhere and said, "Yeah, we want it." So also in the news this month, uh, Microsoft has sued TomTom, the GPS manufacturer. Uh, mostly nothing to worry about. I think there are eight patent violations have cited in the uh, yeah. suit. Yeah. Uh, but three of them relate to Linux insofar as they're used in Linux as well, including things such as FAT32 support. Yes, I mean, um, Microsoft have been making overtures for a while about uh, how they own the FAT patent. Yeah. Which scares well, me. Like, cause, cause USB, I, uh, yeah. iPods, you name it. Well, I, I've written a FAT12 driver for my OS, so I'll end up Your, your OS, my, my OS, what's that called? My OS. My OS, there you go. <laughs> insanely great. But um, yeah, but Microsoft have explicitly said that open source software is not the focal point of this legal action. But I wonder if they're testing the waters. Can they sue based on open source bits and bobs? Is TomTom Tom really the most lucrative user of FAT32? There must be millions of camera manufacturers who haven't got who the I same Who I think plan. have already ponied up. Right. Oh, really? Under oh, the I same kind of so, duress? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, because oh, they. Well, no, not under duress. No, they're aware it's under patented, and they they paid up for it. Right. It's just because Tom Tom are using Linux, and and Tom is using Linux, and it, it comes with Fat Thirty Two built in, it just works. Right. Right. I believe that. I, I didn't didn't son of a similar problem with Fat Support. It's not uncommon. Basically, a, a lot of folks have had the same problem and uh, had to pay up. Basically. Right. Because they, they they legitimately own the patents. If you believe patents are correct, sorry, patents. If you're an American reader, mm. listener, uh, they if you believe patents are correct, they they own the patent. patent. Well, they, yeah, they created it. So, uh, however wrong it may so be. So, what could have Tom Tom done differently? Could they have got a license for Fat32 and the open source implementation of it they're using? I would expect so. Yeah, uh, that or use a different file system because they have <laughs> they have well they have you know the plugin uh, what CF slot they use I think or SD slot SD I think it is. Put the SD card in. That's already been formatted with with Fat. Yeah, yeah. And that's obviously their choice. Now it's the most common choice. It's not a huge surprise sticking Fat on an SD card. Um, but they could have chosen something else and didn't. Uh, and the, what I'm worried about is TomTom Tom against Microsoft. They probably can't win that lawsuit. No matter how correct they may or may not be, they cannot afford to fight them off. Yeah, yeah. Unless they're just just too big. Unless the courts determine that Microsoft is using this like a submarine patent, they've waited for FAT32 to become so commonplace on all these generic MP3 players and cameras, and then they're going out and saying, well, we want some money from this. But like GIF. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's hardly unheard of in the computing industry, <laughs> yeah, is it? You know? yeah. And it's worked fine before, hasn't it, really? So, yeah. uh, Interestingly, my, uh, my satellite PVR uses um, EXT3 formatted USB sticks for copying media. Okay. And it's caused all kinds of problems on the forums okay. with people, <laughs> people not being able to... They, they can't actually create the USB stick formatted in EXT3 easily. Right. Unless del- they delve into the unknown world of Ubuntu Live CDs. Yeah. Well, the way I see it, if, if TomTom, you know, gets an out-of-court settlement to Microsoft... It's basically a tacit admission they were wrong. And that is, I think, what Mike was saying, testing the water. If they, if they can pull off against mm. any, any company, that, yes. that acts as precedent for the next company and the next company and the next company. And, and they're probably um, trying to gauge the reaction of the community. I and mean, they know the community is going to be peeved about it all, but just to what extent? Yeah. It's strange, isn't it? Everyone's already worried about MS suing for you know, really big stuff. And actually, it's, it's FAT32, which is what, Windows 95, 98? Y- yep. Uh, yeah, 95, 90, 95 release 2. Release 2, SR2, of course. Yeah, 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 something like that, yeah. Um, but again, that may be a test in the water. They have a, a big patent war chest, as do a lot of companies. And they yeah. may be saying, well, let's yeah. see if we can sue over a, a small thing like this. Moving on, uh, XFC 4.6, Mike's favourite desktop environment, has is now Yay. out. It's a major update. Mike, why does it kick ass so much? It kicks ass because um, a lot of people will think this is a trivial feature that should have been added ages yes, ago. Yes, yes, say it. Go you, on, say You it. can now select multiple icons on the desktop. Oh, it's such I, a bloody obvious feature. <laughs> it, yes, but you, you've, all, you've been able to do this in the file manager through now for ages. Yes. And, and I, I know this is one of these anecdotal, well, I've never had to do it, but I've never had to select multiple icons <laughs> on my desktop. <laughs> So I've never missed it. 
Because I don't save stuff onto my desktop. Just, to, just so listeners are clear who do not use XFCE, before 4.6, if you yes. have multiple things on a desktop, you can only select them one at a time. How lame is that? Uh, you might be able to select multiple ones with shift, but you couldn't rubber band. <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't drag over them and you just choose them. You couldn't drag over or them. Or you so. could use Thunar and then go to the desktop directory. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. So Gray, Graham's got the solution. But it does have a feature that I haven't seen in any other window manager, not any other mainstream window manager, which is called Fill. And you uh, you press a key combo, and um, XFC Window Manager fills a window up to adjacent windows on the screen without overlapping. So it doesn't oh, just maximise it. Right, so yeah, if, yeah. if you've got a terminal window in the corner and a chat thing at the bottom, it will make the most of that space, and that sounds really, really cool. Was oh, that a toolbar icon or something? Uh, I think you can add it to the to the title oh, nice, bar, but nice. yeah. I'm does, forward to trying. does it dynamically adjust if you move one of the other windows? Will it? Good point. I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't actually got it installed yet. No, I'm waiting for the next Ubuntu version. But uh, yeah. So it, is it in Jaunty? Do you think? Jaunty it's, it's going to be in Jaunty. In fact, they hope to have 4.6.1 in Ubuntu Ooh. Jaunty. So. Well, actually, this is also the first release to use GStreamer. I think for ah. its little mixing thing. It does. The, the yeah. jump shit, which is cool. Yep. And uh, we like standardization. Yep. And the and Thuna now supports the XDG standards. Talking standardization, so you can. Apply themes to folders and stuff. It's pretty cool. It's going to be better than GNOME, definitely. Moving on to our hot topic section. He's doing that on purpose, you know. <laughs> uh, this week's hot topic is, is the Creative Commons license or group of licenses a good thing or a bad thing? Or is it a meh thing? Or is it a meh thing? I've never watched Futurama, so I wouldn't know. Dr. Zoidberg! Um, Andrew, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a meh thing. I don't understand why anyone would want to use Creative Commons. That's probably its biggest problem. You mean understanding the Creative Commons? I mean, I mean, if you're if you're an artist and you're going to give something away, then then fine, give it away. Um, what public domain wise? Yeah, Creative Commons just seems to be an extra layer of complication that there's no need for. It's a solution looking for a problem. But how, how should they give it away? Public domain? Yeah, why not? Well, uh, how can they stop people using their stuff for commercial stuff, for example? Their commercial reasons. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I do see it as, as as the creative side of of what the GPL offers exactly, for programming. Exactly. Yeah, I think the same thing. You do want to have some control over the what what you've put in. You know? It's less that. It's more about giving rights back that weren't there before. So you get copyright. Obviously, everyone knows copyright. You can't use it. Get lost. Basically, copyright. What I like about it is things like share alike now. Yeah, the, yeah. The remixing world has you know really flourished under Creative Commons. And for that reason alone, you know, I know that it causes a huge range of problems because people are like, you know, what does CC by at no derivatives stood at mean and 3.0 unported? <laughs> yeah, license proliferation. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't help that at all. But for people who just want to get out there and mix, it's awesome. You know, regular listeners will recognise our theme song, for example, yep. by Brad Sucks. Uh, and uh, it's great because he released that entire thing as individual tracks and said, listen, knock yourselves out, uh, you know, remix it all you want to. It's really cool. Yeah, and I, but I do think the biggest problem and the reason why perhaps it hasn't been as successful as it could have been is is the fact that the terms of the license, if you actually click on them rather than the, the small abbreviations everybody uses, the terms are very difficult to understand and not that much different to other commercial licenses or and I think that's what's stopping its its use its usage. Well, being full of legalese and but isn't, yeah. isn't that yeah. point the, the the little bullet point one with pictures is for people like us to use? Yeah, and for the lawyers who want to know what does it really mean, you know, that make my job worthwhile, they've got the legalese. Yes, yes, you're right, but but I don't understand why it can be described using a couple of friendly icons and then has all this all this rubbish behind it. One kind of person won't read right, and the other kind of person won't read the other, you see. And then there, yeah, are, yeah. there are vagaries in the English language as well, aren't there? You look at legalese, and it, and it makes everything really clear, you know, the product, the company, and uh, in capitals, and... Um, Did you say legalese make things, every, everything's really clear? That's, just, that's, that's the opposite of what well, I would well, say. It, it does, if, if you understand If you're a it lawyer, all. yeah. It, yes, you're yeah, it, 100,000 million pounds yeah, an hour. It, it's, it, it's massively <laughs> verbose, but... Um, it, the reason uh, it is that for both is so that if you study it, you know what every little part means. Right. There's no escape clause. There's no there. ambiguity. To say, well, th is this called free in this sense? You know. Yeah. So, Andrew, if you worked on an album um, with your guitar back at home in your bedroom, it took you 18 months, and you wanted to release it, but you couldn't get a record company. You couldn't generate any interest. Would you release it as a pub as public domain? Probably not. No. What, what would you use if I released it? Yeah. I think I would release it. I just keep it for myself. <laughs> a very teenage angsty of you. <laughs> well, I would, I would, and I suppose I have done. I would use the Creative Commons license, and it's not. You've, you've released music. Where is that? Oh, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's it I, I really wouldn't want to break anybody's sound system but but um i think i think i genuinely think it's better to be released under some sort of open license like this than just sitting at home on your hard drive and it gives you a good reason to to put it somewhere and get it out there even if no one listens to it yeah i think even your uh, attempt at replaying guitar hero songs in your guitar <laughs> <laughs> people can remix that into something better and worthwhile <laughs> that actually builds the commons into a worthwhile place so even though you, even though it's not doing a lot for you getting it out there stick it under a free license people can uh, do something with it maybe what it needs is the creative commons version of sourceforge some something that we can all recognize as a as an open pool for for media licensed under the creative commons license well there, there is that for small things uh, for, like for subdomains like you know gemendo yeah yeah great site for music that's awesome then you look at artwork and you've got openclipart.org Uh-oh. which is well not even go there it's a mm. disaster area quite frankly but some things it works really well i think people don't seem to care so much which is a real shame but when you when you google up those kind of terms like open or free clip art or free samples and loops it's a minefield of mm. commercial sites and it's often they'll say they're free and and you have to actually really look into it before you discover that they're not free at all and that they're very restrictive licenses. Yeah, they've got gigantic watermarks all over. Yeah, music for a podcast, for example, is very difficult if you want the right range of freedom. Do you think there are too many Creative Commons licenses, too many variations, or that's just going to be the natural way it works, you know, to be used in non-commercial works or commercial works? I don't know how many there are. No, neither do I. <laughs> I think if, well, if you count it up, it's like, you know, it's like buying a Ford. You can have Ford with CD player, Ford mm. with multi disc CD player, Ford with leather seats, Ford with normal seats, Ford with da-da-da-da, metallic paint. There are lots of options when buying a car, but you're still buying a Ford. And recognises the brand and knows what it means. And yeah, end yeah. of the day, you don't have to know all the different combinations. You just have to know what CC is, what buy means, what share alike means, yeah, what no just, derivatives means, what non-commercial means. Those are things they're not very hard, aren't they? Yeah. Know the individual things, and together you can figure out any license. I think so. There could be a thousand combinations. It doesn't really matter because there's only like four things to worry about. Don't fall asleep just yet. We're now halfway through the podcast and rushing through as fast as we possibly can. Still to come, we've got discovery of the week. And our open ballot question is, are there too many distros? So it is the best section of the podcast, if I may say so myself. Award winning. It's, it's unbelievable. It's insanely great. It is, of course, Discovery of the Week, where we um, look at things we've found in the Linux free software world over the last couple of weeks, aka Fortnite, and tell you all about them. So, Paul, what have Why is you? it always me first? Oh, I think Graham. Like, there we go. Ah, on the spot. <laughs> I think I was first on one of those ones. You were first on the first one, I think. So uh, my uh, discovery. I, I'm it sure, was me. I'm sure our listeners will let us know. Okay, you Please go. Leave. You go for it. No, it was me. It was me. It was Graham first time first because oh. he did a music. That thing. means it's oh. Andrew first this time, surely. <laughs> but Andrew's Silence. like the punchline of this section. Right? <laughs> 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 He's the comic relief section. That happened. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, mine's not particularly innovative, but I love it anyway. Uh, we've put a feature on the website. Talks very recently about this. Uh, it's a gnome do or gnome do, particularly pedantic gnome do. Uh, it 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 it's awesome. It's really really good. You have to try this, folks. It is insanely great and all those wonderful Steve Jobisms. Uh, it's great. Awesome. Uh, you you once it's installed, you just press super space bar, which is probably Windows space bar unless you're on a Mac, and it pops up. Type a few letters of your favorite program, your Google document, your Twitter, anything you want. And hit enter, and it'll do the smart thing that you've been doing in the past. It learns what you do and adapts itself to fit around your working patterns. It's just incredible. It's got so many plugins. I use Identica and Tomboy and apt-get and Google Documents and the files and folders search. It just plugs into everything. Search through Google Documents? Yeah. You, How you, does that? You give, it, you give it your name and password. Really? Yeah. And then it yeah. goes it online? Can, it can search your Google contacts too. And mail folks. Right, so it searches the contents of those documents. It, it can find the document names. Right. Yeah. Ah, right. I see. So, I, so you can tap your things, and enter, and it pops up a browser straight away to start working on them. That is really good. I, I yeah. thought it was just like um, the spotlight. I, so did I. Clone, yeah, but, I thought, but hearing that feature, searching no, say, online. You can, if, you, if you type, you know, uh, K snapshot, enter, it'll uh, it'll do apt get K snapshot on mine. Oh, right. right. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's cool. It's, it's, oh, it's really cool. You, you don't realize how much time you waste using the mouse until you switch to Gnome Do. They need to put this in every distro. We, we, were, we were talking about like this just yesterday, Mike. What would it be like if Ubuntu jaunty said, okay, scrap this whole bottom and top panel thing and stick Docky on? Docky yeah. is one of the default look and feel things for uh, Gnome Do. It's a little, little Mac OS X style rip-off Docky thing, and uh, it works really good. But it's got Gnome Do built into it, so you press uh, Summon Gnome Do and you can start typing straight away. Get the same kind of functionality. Again, it learns what you're doing, so it chooses the right thing, the smart thing every time. 
until you've tried it, you cannot understand how much it kicks ass. Yes. It's it's so cool, and it's not something no one else has got right now. Well, it sounds very similar to the um, the Alt F2 combination in KDE, which brings up a uh, a small field where you type in the name of a program and it runs it. Correct. Yes. Except this time, uh, it it learns what you're doing. Yeah. So it'll do a smart thing as you're doing it, and it's got. For example, if you can press uh, uh, full stop or period if you're in, a, in the US and start typing and it'll just basically free type mode and you can switch to copy to clipboard or submit to Twitter or whatever straight away oh, from right. that wow. so if a hit it'll go into Identica, Identica straight away for all your friends to read it's, yeah, yeah. it's it, so integrated it's it's, it sounds so clever I'm slightly scared of it becoming sentient and taking <laughs> over the world <laughs> it's, it, it's just great and it, all it does is the best bit about it all it does is it brings together things that were already cool elsewhere mm. into one little place there's, there's not a great deal of logic behind it it just learns what you've been doing and records it that's it it just looks great. It requires compositing for its themes because they look hot. The glass thing particularly looks really smooth. Uh, of course, if you like uh, OS X star stuff, you can get Docky. It just looks great. It adds more gloss to Linux, which I think is going to pull people in. Right, well, here's to it being in the next batch of discs. Damn right. Let's see it. Come on, Shuttle. Darn Do it. <laughs> right. Hey, um, um, my uh, my discovery of the week is um, an application called Picard. Picard? Is it about yeah. music, Graham? Um, it is, actually. Amazing! <laughs> <laughs> well, we named um, this Graham's music section. Yeah, yeah. In, um, in Linux Format magazine last month, I complained that my music collection has a terrible array of tags, which means I can't sort them, I can't... For example, that really makes it impossible to work with things like uh, Songbird and Amarok, which seem to depend on tag databases. Picard is closely related to Music Brains, which you might have seen on things like Amarok and uh, Rhythmbox. And Music Brains is a big online database that kind of takes over from um, FreeDB. Oh, yeah. But the clever part of Music Brains and Picard, which is the uh, front end to it, is that it takes a 10-second scan of, of a piece of music and then uses an acoustic fingerprint from that 10 seconds to find out what the song is, find out what the track is, and sync the tag information with that held on the single database. So, so it's like Shazam combined. Exactly with. like that. Exactly. Right. Apart from it's all open source, um, and, and Picard itself is written in Python. And it's fantastic. You just leave it running overnight on your music collection, and everything becomes homogenized and easy to use and works well once again is it the one fatal flaw with this do you remember stock Aiken Waterman that <laughs> produced thousands of singles that all sound roughly the same yeah yeah. <laughs> how would it handle that <laughs> well yeah maybe, maybe my stock Aiken and Waterman collection will <laughs> suffer <laughs> well, yeah will suffer <laughs> I've just thought, actually, what if we run Richard Stallman's free software song through this system? <laughs> How will it tag it? That's not a bad idea, yeah. We it, must do that. It might sound like Stock Aitken and Waterman. <laughs> yes, it might indeed. Or perhaps they could redo the free... It's a, it's a rare Kylie B-side. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks to John Spriggs for sending that uh, link over to me because he responded to my moan in the magazine. Cool. Meanwhile, my discovery is a um, platform game a remake of a 1988 platform game, and it's called Captain S. Um, but the blurb is just fantastic, so bear with me a minute here. The blurb says, A calm day begins in Seville. Mariano Lopez goes to his job as a sausage delivery man. Meanwhile, <laughs> at Santi Ponche's interetrastrophic device <laughs> centre, everybody is getting ready for the first fully Spanish rocket launch, designed by the famous Dr. Torre Bruno, an eminent nuclear physicist who had to leave the project prematurely due to a strange mental disease. But nobody expected the rocket to suffer a sudden variation on its path, and it falls right on the truck that Mariano Lopez uses to transport a cargo of sausages. Mariano, now unconscious, lies on the floor beside his, beside his sausages and the truck's wreckage. I think I'll use that vinyl scratch sound on this bit. <laughs> <laughs> Some hours later, he wakes up really hungry and eats an entire box of the radiated sausages. But what the hell is happening? Mariano is becoming different. Every muscle grows. He becomes taller. His ugly face becomes a pretty superhero's, that of Captain S, who discovers that everything was part of the evil Dr. Tori Bruno's plan with the true intention of ruling the world starting with Seville. It's now Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so this this Torre Bruno guy who's got a mental disease. Yeah. Did he become a game programmer by any chance? <laughs> uh, I can't really I can't really make much sense for it. In, in, in play, it's kind of a, a stock 2D platform. Run around, punch things, jump over, avoid enemies. Double dragon. Yeah, yes. But with sausages. But with, <laughs> with, but with radiator sausages. Have the breakfast! <laughs> I, I think it's inspired. It's uh, But note... It's definitely inspired. Which yeah. is inspired by what? <laughs> well, that's true. And note that um, the URL will be in the notes that go alongside this podcast on TuxRadio.com. And the download is a tar bomb, which means it's it extracts all its files in the current directory, so... 
extract it in a separate directory beforehand. Have you played what? it? <laughs> yeah. Was it any good? He, he was playing, yeah. hammering the key, start the game, start the game, yeah, start the I game. I couldn't escape from the demo, but... <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. I did play it, but it was very hard. Now it's time for the open ballots. Uh, a couple of days ago, we asked you on tuxradar.com and the Linux format blog, are there too many Linux distros that they get in the way? Do we have too much choice? Um, Paul, why don't we start with you again? Go on, Paul. Right, let me just try and formulate an opinion about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's normally stop you. That's true, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's worth saying on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> We can't shy away from these tough questions. No, we can't. No, not, not on the Tux Radar podcast. We can't. No, no. All right, ultimately, I think uh, a lot of newbies are getting confused. There's too much choice for them. And I don't think that's a result of having too many distros. I think it's a result of there being too many distros and people not accurately or easily filtering out the dross. By that I mean, have all the distros you want. Let's have a breeding ground, a petri dish of distros, growing and breeding and exchanging all their ideas and stuff and changing the wallpapers, which is basically most of them all they ever do. But then let's make it clear for newbies which are the ones they want to be looking at. How, how would you do that? Who would you appoint to say these are good, these aren't good? What we need is a really good uh, magazine about Linux. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What, Ubuntu format? Ubuntu <laughs> format. <laughs> Yeah, well, oh, the thing is, you know, um, you know, Distro Watch has its ranking thing, you know, top 20 or so, and I expect, I don't want to use buzzwords and stuff, but I expect we've got a bit of a long tail going on here, whereas the top three or four get the lion's share of uh, users, and the rest sort of trickle away into, you know, a very, very, very long tail in our case. And, uh, you know, I think that's good. I want choice, but I don't want people saying, you know, we, who was it? It was uh, Russell James, who was working on Mac Format magazine at the time. Great magazine. Buy it. It's great. Uh, he said, uh, I've got this Linux thing and I've put it on my Mac and it's really hard. And I said, really, Russell? That doesn't sound right. He said, yeah, it's called, it's called Gen 2. Gen? How did he get it on his Mac? <laughs> I said, oh, what, why did you start with Gen 2? That's your problem. And, you know, it may have put him off Linux for life, in a way. Yes. And No, you know, Gen 2's great. I'm glad it's there. But it's not the best starting place of folks coming from Mac OS X. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I'd say with a bit more guidance on which ones we're starting with. Mike, Mike you're almost with your Mike OS. You're sort of partly responsible for the dire <laughs> fragmentation of open source. <laughs> can you accept any personal responsibility? Yes, I can. I did it. I think um, I, I agree with a, um, a lot of the sentiment of what Paul says. Um, we all have to do a better job of communicating which distros are worth trying, but. I think also that there's a kind of um, natural selection element to them as well. The, the best ones will be used by more people, so they'll recommend them, so they get used more often, and they will filter their way up to the top. Um, but, you know, if, if we'd always just settled on a few, said, right, Mandriva and Susan and Red Hat, or Fedora, are the distros people should use, Ubuntu comes along, and everybody said, no, no, ignore that, it's just too new, it's too obscure, it's too weird. We have to... We have to always be trying new distros, always looking at distros, even if they look crap, even if they look really obscure and, and, and you know, there's hardly been much development work done on them because the, the next Ubuntu will come from somewhere like that. But isn't that the flip side of natural selection, uh, the thinning of the herd, where the, the weak ones get cut off, quite frankly? <laughs> I'm not saying you know, we should terminate the life support on the other distros, but you know, let them be on SourceForge in stage one planning. That's fine, they can do all they want in SourceForge. Um, but they shouldn't be detracting from the main event, I think, in a way. No, but I, I don't really know if they do. You know, we we kind of go on Distro Watch, and we yeah, but like a Distro Watch. You think about it, it's it's a, it's basically posted like a blog. New entries go to the top yeah. naturally. So when Ubuntu comes out, there it is, and then of course, you know, Paul Hudson X, yeah. or whatever comes out, it goes above it and gets the same same kind of coverage. How can a new user differentiate between the two? I, I think I have to agree with Paul. I do think it causes a problem, especially when people don't understand what Linux is. Um, it, once again, I, I read in the newspaper at the weekend somebody describing what Linux is, and they said there are hundreds of Linux distributions after describing what a Linux distribution was. And in brackets they said, no, really, just go and check. Almost as if it's, it's a joke that, you know, there are so many... People have put so much effort into creating their own distribution to scratch one specific itch. It's something that most people don't seem to understand the need for. I mean, we understand it because we're geeks. Mm. But outside of the Linux, the direct Linux community, I think it makes it very difficult to have a, a, a single unified front. But for the itch scratching thing, why, isn't that why we have Task Cell on Debian? You know, you could say mm. Task Cell, Smooth Wall, whatever. 
and it would just happen to all the right packages, the right configuration options, and you've got smooth wall basically. But end of the day, it's still a, a you know Debian un- underneath it all good, quite easily. It will, yeah, you can customize Debian to serve the role of many other distros. Yeah, but it is still Debian. If, if the, a revolutionary package manager comes out, it will be in another distro. I think Microsoft had a similar problem with uh, Vista. Too many versions of Vista, everybody got confused. And there's, that there's that no wasn't actually the only problem with Vista. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad someone mentioned DistroWatch because we have here an email from Ladislav Bodnar, curator and owner of that website. He says, I always maintain that once you exclude all the highly specialist and regional distributions, you won't have more than a dozen, maybe two dozen if you really stretch it. The rest is a moving target. They arrive, they're around until the enthusiasm of the founder lasts, then they disappear. Right now, DistroWatch lists almost 600 distros, of which about 300 are classified as active. Of these, don't be surprised if at least half don't make another release. Now that brings us down to about 150. And once you start excluding all the mini distros, firewalls, gateways, netbook distros, specialist server distros, and distros with support for Mongolian and Swahili, you're left with just a dozen. Um, so no, there aren't too many distros. And all of the 100,000 people who visit distrowatch.com every day seem to agree. But why are there distros for Swahili? I mean, doesn't, doesn't Ubuntu officially support Latin, Klingon, and other random languages like that. Why isn't there space in that for existing distros? People get very patriotic about their distros, don't they? I mean, the, the French always like French distributions, and the Germans like German distributions, and the English, we like American distributions. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, country I, fail. I think the Swahili distros are there more to, to serve the needs of a developer than any community. It's someone wants something to be in charge of and say, this is mine, and I made it. Even It doesn't matter that there's Swahili support in Ubuntu. They've, they've got their own little fiefdom, their own corner of the internet. So in their own control of? In control. Mm. Opinion is divided among our esteemed readers, which is how we like it. Um, Hugh says when he got curious about Linux, he simply checked DistroWatch for the major distros and asked around on message boards and in IRC. And he says he got the same responses everywhere. Um, people recommended the same three or four distros, so he had a good starting point. He obviously didn't have the problem that Russell had with people recommending that he use Gentoo. Um, Don Oreo says, yes, there are too many. Uh, he, what he really objects to is the many derivatives of distros, such as Ubuntu, Kubuntu, Zubuntu, that just basically change the wallpaper and little else. Ah, Zubuntu rules. Lithium X reckons that the problem occurs when you get 100 different distros all working on the same premise, i.e. they're easy to use desktop with full multimedia support, all using the same basic repositories and differing only in the colour of their wallpaper. That, to me, is a very inefficient use of resources and creative talent. Actually, I, I, that's one place where I think I disagree. I, well, I, would, I wouldn't be so upset about all the distro spin-offs if they were more standardised. If the LSB said, listen, I'm sorry, you know, RPM, I'm sorry, APT, one of them, you've got to go, or at least have a front end which works in you know, a package kit, whatever that is, so that people can go between distros smoothly, software works across distros smoothly, none of this more, you know, configure, make, make, install crap. I want to double click on things now. I think end users do too. If they were, they were able to do that, LSB did that kind of standardization, they could have as millions of distros in the whole world, I wouldn't care, because I could put, I could use any one of them and it'd just work. So what was the result of that open ballot? Roughly 50-50. Too much choice is confusing, but choice is always good. So Mike, yes or no? Um... What's the question? Yeah. Are there too many distros? Are there too many distros? No. Uh, that's a yes from me. And uh, mine's yes and no. <laughs> no, 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 not too many. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, that's not allowed. Yeah, you're right, it's not allowed. Yeah, yeah, it's not allowed. <laughs> no, okay, ultimately no. No, there aren't too many. I'm happy to see more. You turncoat. Oh. It's not a turncoat. <laughs> I've, I've clarified it. They can be as many as they want, just stay out of my way. <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Do what you like. In your bedroom. Well, I, I definitely agree with Rakios, who says, no, if Linux is all about choice, then the large numbers of distros being actively developed and supported shows us that choice is what people want. That means Graham's all by himself, then. Graham. For a change? Just for a change. Yeah. And that brings us to the end of our podcast this week. What? There is one more thing. Oh, go on, Mike. It's just one more, a command line thing. You know when you're at the shell prompt and yeah. you want to save the output of a bunch of commands you're typing right. in? You can redirect the output to a text file or copy and paste and all yes. that nonsense. Yes. There is a better way to do this, believe it or not. <clears throat> if, at, the, at the command line prompt, if you enter script, 
enter scripts and you'll get a new shell session which records everything you enter and all the output into a file called TypeScript. That's pretty good. That's pretty it's impressive. Yeah, 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 I like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 Well done. Yeah, yeah. This is great. And then when you've finished your session, enter exit or hit control and D, and then you will you can use that TypeScript file. It'll have all the input, all the output. You can put it on the internet if you need help with something. It's awesome. It That's the best one wrong. yet. It is. Are you breaking with form slightly there by giving a useful one? <laughs> yeah, probably, next week it'll be something incredibly trivial about um, XFCE. XFCE. Okay. And that brings us to the definite end of our podcast for this week. Just a reminder, uh, you can subscribe to Linux Format for the awesome price of $99 for 13 issues at tinyurl.com slash podcast at XF. All the notes for this podcast are, of course, on tuxrail.com. Tune in in two weeks for more japery. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.